ओके बिस्मजीत Hello and good morning, everyone. On behalf of uh, CSIR SRTB team at CSIR NIST and Director CSIR NIST, Dr. J. Narahari Sastri, it is my pleasant duty to welcome you all to today's eminent scientist lecture. And this morning, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Madhavan Nair Rajivan, Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India, as our eminent speaker. Sir, first of all, I give thanks to you, sir, for accepting our request to deliver today's lecture. And we are live on uh, YouTube, Facebook, and MS Teams. Thank you so much once again, sir. And I thank uh, Professor Alok Dhawan, Director, CSI IITR, Lucknow, and Dr. Ranjana Agarwal, CSI and East States, New Delhi, directors of both uh, CSI sister laboratories for joining us this morning. So uh, without any further ado, I think uh, we shall begin with today's program. So now it is uh, my pleasure to request Dr. Sastri to please give his welcome remarks. Thank Over you, to you and sir. Good Thank you very much and very good morning to all of you. And we are so fortunate to have Dr. Madhavan Nair Rajivan who is uh, one of the very highly accomplished scientists and currently the secretary for Minister of Earth Sciences and Chairman Earth Commission. And I would like to bring to Professor Alok Dhawan will introduce uh, Dr. Rajivan. And I would like to bring to your notice that this uh, summer research training program has enabled us to bring the topmost leadership and policy makers of the country to speak to a large number of young people. And we are very much grateful to you, sir, for taking your time. And this is of tremendous use for all the people that are there. And I hope that all of you, all the participants will great get the full benefit of this particular situation and on behalf of CSIR, on behalf of uh, summer research training program, I thank uh, Dr. Rajivan for give, accepting this invitation and uh, Professor Alok Bhavan for is instrumental in uh, making these communications and then uh, in planning along with Dr. Professor Ranjana Agarwal and uh, many of my colleagues and on behalf of all of them, I really thank Dr. Rajivan for uh, talking on the very, very important topic of the science of climate change. Uh, we don't have to uh, emphasize the importance of the climate change, and it's very, very important for us to understand the science of climate change. With this, I request Professor Alok Dhawan to introduce Professor Rajivan. Uh, thank you very much, Shastri, and uh, it is a proud privilege uh, not only for me, but also CSIR to uh, have a very accomplished academician as well as a science administrator uh, in Dr. Madhavan Nair Rajivan, who is the Secretary Ministry of Earth Sciences. And not only that, he has served at very various positions and earlier to joining his current position. He was the director of uh, Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology at Pune. Uh, Dr. Rajivan is known for his work in the area of uh, monsoon variability and monsoon predictions. And he was also able to develop models for the same, which were used across the country. Uh, because of his uh, academic excellence, he has been elected the fellow of all the three major uh, science academies of this country. And also is a member of the International uh, Academy of Astronomics, Astronautics, high level advisor and expert member in research board of climate services to the World Meteorological Organization. And he serves as a chairman uh, and member of the board of several institutes in the country. 
Um, apart from that, of course, uh, as I mentioned, he is uh, a scientist of uh, high repute and he serves on the editorial board of various journals and has been uh, awarded several awards, um, both as a young scientist as well as as a senior person. Uh, I think it is our privilege, uh, not only for the scientists, but also for the students to hear to such a company. And then again, this is the sea. So there's a large global scale as well as regional scale hydrological cycle also happening. So uh, if we really talk about climate, we should talk about all these things together. And when you talk about climate change, there are two causes. One is the internal cause and there's an external cause. The external cause means anything outside the earth system uh, can cause the climate change. For example, change in the intensity of solar radiation. We know that solar radiation is coming and there's a solar constant and uh, how much we know how much uh, solar radiation uh, reaching at the top of the atmosphere because with the satellite data we know how much is coming. So there can be changes in the solar radiance uh, coming at the top of the atmosphere that can change the climate, mean climate. And uh, also the orbital parameter the Earth is rotating. So these are all ca can cause anthropogenic, uh, these are all anthropogenic activity we call and it can also cause uh, changes in the mean climate. So I will tell you, as I told that the uh, sun's radiation is the main uh, driving uh, energy. So incoming solar radiation is coming. So we receive uh, some amount of uh, 340 watt, uh, 42 watts per meter square energy we receive. So any, any body, it's a uh, physics uh, law, any body uh, more than zero degree Kelvin should emit radiation. And for some blood room temperature, we emit it at about 10 micro, micrometer, 10 micro and uh, sun's radiation at peak is around 0.5. So sun's radiation be the earth receive it, but the earth also is emitting uh, radiation out um, at the space. So then, then there is a balance between what we receive from sun and what we, what the earth's, uh, uh, earth's, earth's radiation going out. So there's a balance between uh, solar radiation coming and earth radiation going out. Earth radiation going out is in the longer wavelength is called infrared radiation for a sun's radiation is solar radiation. And um, so, there's a, so there's a big balance between these two. So any imbalance between these two energy, um, the solar radiation coming inside and uh, outgoing long wave radiation, outgoing long wave radiation from the Earth's sphere is, if it is this imbalance, then that can make a lot of changes in the climate. It can change the Earth's energy balance and that can induce changes in the temperature and many other. So any a lot of feedback processes will also occur. Put it in some numbers. For example, uh, so, so solar constant is about 1380 watts per meter square. And uh, and if you really take the sphere, if I assume that Earth is a whole sphere, and Earth radiation is, uh, and, and some radiation will be reflected back. So whatever solar radiation is coming, it can be reflect, it will be reflected back by clouds as well as the aerosols, aerosol scattering in the atmosphere and also the land surface can reflect back. So some radiation going back, about 30% of the solar radiation will go back. And so they, so we call albedo is 0.3, um, the global albedo is 0.3. So, so solar radiation, whatever we receive 100 units, 30 units goes back. And remaining 70 units were used for uh, energy balance in that atmosphere. And whereas the outgoing energy is E into 4 pi per square because the whole sphere is emitting radiation out. And whereas the sun's radiation is only the one fourth of the Earth's surface. So if you really calculate, you can calculate, albedo we know from satellites, we can calculate how much solar radiation is going back. So it's calculated as 0.31 or so. And uh, so measured energy is 237 watts per meter square. So equivalent temperature we can calculate. It comes around minus 18. But if you really calculate our uh, yes temperature, it's yes, a mean temperature. It's about 15 degree. So how we will explain with the theoretical calculation? It comes around minus 18, and theoretical and the actual uh, temperature is about 15 degrees. So how we will? Uh, so the actual temperature is much more than the equilibrium temperature 
from the energy balance from between solar outgoing only energy and that is mainly because of the so called effect called greenhouse effect there are so many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which uh, don't allow the earth's radiation to go out to the space and uh, and it cuts off cuts off the outgoing long wave radiation and that can explain about the changes about 33 kelvin or so and more, and one of the most important greenhouse gas is water vapor water vapor contributes to maximum uh, greenhouse effect in the atmosphere but greenhouse and uh, water vapor is a natural gas and it's not produced by human being and but there are uh, greenhouse gases which can uh, influence which can be influenced by human activities for some carbon dioxide carbon emission due to you, we are burning a lot of fossil fuel it can release a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere water vapor as they said that even though it is very prominent the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere but it's a natural gas it's it's, it's a, it cannot be influenced by human activity and uh, so if you really calculate uh, 100 units of energy is coming from the top and you can see that um, about 6 percentage is reflected by the atmosphere 20 percentage by clouds and 4 percentage is by air surface so about 30 percentage it goes up um, goes back and this is called albedo and 70 percentage is in the atmosphere and surface surface about 50 percentage comes in the surface so 20 percentage again is absorbed in the in the atmosphere so left hand side is solar energy right hand side as i said that it is in long wave radiation it's a, the energy emitted by the earth's atmosphere as well as surface and uh, so if you really see the top of the top uh, figure right hand side 64 percentage and 6 percentage 64 percentage is radiated to space from clouds and atmosphere and 6 percentage is radiated from the surface of the earth so if you take uh, together it is 70 percentage And that, and 70 percentage is incoming because 30 percentage is already going out. So 30 plus this 70 it will be equivalent to 100 percentage. So there is a top of the atmosphere. There is a clear balance between what is coming from the sun and what is going out from the earth's uh, sphere. So if, if within the atmosphere, if there are, as I told you, there are greenhouse gases which can contribute to the greenhouse effect. And some of these greenhouse effect, gases can be influenced by human activities for some reason. carbon dioxide methane ozone etc and that can change this energy balance it can have an induce a imbalance between what is being received and what is going out in the outer space and uh, why we call greenhouse we must have seen in uh, many agriculture field there are some greenhouse as are kept uh, it's, a, it's made of glasses in which uh, we put plants inside which is just to keep it warm and what it does is it allows the solar radiation going inside the, uh, the uh, inside the, the, the house but it doesn't allow the uh, the long wave radiation to go out so it, the, the 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 whole atmosphere will be warm and this our real atmosphere also behaves the same way and so this is the greenhouse effect which i explained about 3 what is 43 watts per meter square is received at the top of the atmosphere and 103 is going out from uh, solar radiation reflected back the 240 watts per meter square is the outgoing long wave radiation we call and all this radiative fluxes can be calculated estimated using satellites and we have been measuring it for last 25 30 years and this is the spectrum if you really see the electromagnetic radiation the radiative spectrum and you can see that uh, incoming solar radiation is in the visible channel uh, whereas the outgoing long wave radiation is in the outer uh, long wave uh, spectrum is in infrared radiation and uh, so we we'll peak about 10 micron or so and uh, if you really see the different gases it has different in, different absorb absorbing absorption channels and for example high, water vapor has an absorption channel carbon dioxide has a lot of uh, absorption channels ozone and uh, oxygen has a different absorption channels and uh, and the, along um, uh, you can see that the window in which the atmospheric radiation so air radiation going out around 10 micron so there's a lot of uh, uh, absorption can be taken place because of carbon dioxide water vapor as well as uh, ozone and that so uh, again i am coming back to the original uh, slide which i shown earlier is the there can be two internal causes one is the natural variability another is the human activity so as i told that external cause the present climate change what we are expecting what we are uh, experiencing now is not caused by external forces it is all caused by internal causes and that also due to human activity 
And so there are, um, so uh, have you seen any changes in the greenhouse gas for the last 20, 40 years or 100 years? The answer is yes. For example, we have seen, seen changes in carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, and nitrous oxide, but there are not changes in the water vapor. Water vapor is conserved. And um, the human activities, what are the human activities? It's industrialization, deforestation, and uh, public transport, and land use changes. Land use changes also is very important aspect. We remove forest and food agriculture, we remove many other agriculture field and make construct, construct the buildings, etc. So we, we go on changing the land surface properties and land surface characteristics. And if you really calculate, if you really put a graph showing how this carbon dioxide, methane, etc. have changed last uh, uh, thousand years, this is the one, uh, one figure very clearly shows that. You can see that there, there are variations in the past. And um, but if you really see that recent years, the extreme right, and you can see that the drastic change, the short rise in uh, the mean concentration of uh, carbon dioxide as well as methane and other gases. So it's uh, this kind of uh, large rise in uh, carbon dioxide or methane was not seen in the previous past uh, thousands of years. We have not seen such kind of it's a very unprecedented uh, rise, short rise of carbon dioxide concentration as well as methane concentration, which we are seeing at present. And this is another diagram. It's, it's a carbon dioxide, methane, and estimated global temperature. People, you may ask the question, how we calculate, how we can really estimate? We did not have observations, uh, instrument, instruments to measure carbon dioxide, methane. We can do it using uh, some techniques called ice core techniques. What we do is in Antarctica, there are some huge ice cores. We can go there and make a drill and take the ice core. Or we can, if you go very deep, you can go in the past climate and you can measure uh, the gases trapped in these ice cores and using uh, so many techniques, carbon dating for some. And uh, this kind of techniques you can use and ice cores can be taken out from Antarctica as well as Arctic. And you can do this kind of uh, analysis, uh, analytical uh, studies, and calculate the estimate the carbon dioxide, methane, and temperature also. Now, if you really see this uh, variation in the carbon dioxide, methane, and temperature, you can see that uh, carbon dioxide in the past is almost a kilo year, uh, and uh, before 1850, you can see that it never went above 300 parts per million ppm. And now the latest values are most very close to 420 or so. So such kind of large increase in the carbon dioxide was not seen in the past. Uh, same way in the carbon uh, methane. And uh, temperature also, temperature in recent years is not seen. Uh, the, the rise in temperature which we are seeing now has not seen last uh, few hundred years back. And uh, the, this is the, and whether do we have an observation? Uh, very high quality observations of uh, carbon dioxide. The answer is yes. Uh, the person who started is uh, the great uh, Charles Keeling. He started an observatory of carbon dioxide measurements at Mauna Loa. Mauna Loa have an observatory on the top of the hill, and this is an astronomical observatory. There he kept a, a measurement uh, uh, measurement system in which a carbon dioxide can be measured. So from nine, late 1950s, uh, the carbon dioxide is, is being measured. You can see the, the top uh, figure which clearly shows that carbon dioxide uh, parts per million is going up. It is more than 420 watts per, sorry, parts per, per million. And, uh, and in the beginning of uh, our, the 1950s, it was around less than 320 watts. As I told that this kind of the, the, part of the carbon dioxide concentration never went above 300 parts per million. So, and this observatory is still continuing and it's a great uh, contribution by Charles Keeling. We have very high quality observations of the carbon dioxide. And if you really calculate the relative contribution, if you really estimate the relative contribution of different greenhouse gases, and this is the, the, the result, which is, uh, shows a kind of increase of different greenhouse gases from 1980s to 2018, you can see that the maximum contribution of the changes has occurred in carbon dioxide. Methane also has changed, and also nitrous oxide has changed, and also the CFC, chlorofluorocarbons, 11 as well as 12, uh, which are also uh, 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 responsible for ozone hole in the Antarctica, CFCs, and other minor gases. So there's about 1990 to 2018, there's about 43% of change have occurred uh, in terms of the carbon dioxide, sorry, the changes in the uh, concentration of these uh, greenhouse gases.
So the main uh, contribution comes from carbon dioxide, but then methane, then nitrous oxide, and other minor things. Uh, yeah, this I was talking about land use changes. You can see that uh, there's a lot of changes in the land use uh, from 1750 to 1800, then 1990. Uh, we have changed uh, the pattern of agriculture, for example. We changed the pattern of uh, uh, constructions and making urban, uh, so called urbanization. So, all these changes also have, uh, because <clears throat> as I showed, the surface. Uh, Surface, the earth surface also reflects solar radiation, and um, and uh, that that, uh, that can be affected by the, the nature of the uh, surface. If it is um, ice or snow, it reflects more radiation, and if it is uh, some other surface, it will be reflecting. For example, if it is um, uh, vegetation, it reflects less solar radiation back. So the surface uh, albedo also is changed by the land use changes, and it's all caused by human activities. So, question is yes. Okay. So, we have uh, this uh, balance um, uh, between, uh, yes, uh, so, sorry, solar radiation as well as Earth's radiation going back and greenhouse gases are there in the atmosphere. Any changes in the greenhouse gases can offset this uh, balance, energy balance. And we have seen that uh, greenhouse gas concentrations are changing for last, at least last uh, 50, 60 years, especially carbon dioxide, methane. And we, these are all unprecedented changes of greenhouse changes in the greenhouse gas concentration. The next question is, if so, what? Have you seen any change of temperature, precipitation, or any other parameter? So I will describe in another few slides how we have seen the changes in there. So and before that, what we are, I would like to make, uh, give one slide, one just one information. Scott. This, uh, there's a good science happening everywhere, in, even in India, it's called paleo climate. Well, well, we wanted to know, we, we wanted to know what was our past climate. How many years we can go back and, and make the good uh, estimate of how was our climate? This is almost uh, 500 million years back where people have gone and estimated how was our climate. And the recent uh, period we call Holocene and the present uh, epoch, uh, climate epoch, we have people are talking about Anthropocene. And, uh, and these are all can be estimated using proxy methods. These are all not direct measurements proxy methods from earth as well as life sciences to obtain data previously preserved within the rocks. So people take sometimes some people take the rocks, some people take the sediments, some people bore holes, uh, and some people take ice sheets, some people take the tree rings. Uh, tree rings is very popular. Our institute in Pune, IIT Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, they, they have done a lot of work going to the forest and cutting uh, uh, tree rings and making an uh, analysis. And corals, shells, microfossils, there's a good institute in Lagno who has been, they, they have been doing a lot of work. They are very famous for um, taking fossils and uh, trying to understand our past climate. So these are the many ways we can understand our the, what was our the past climate. Now we are worried about future climate. And this is the actual uh, temperature change for last uh, 100 years, 114 years. You can see every year temperature is warming except one or two places, of course, the gray area in the Africa and some parts of America, South America, all the, their data are not available. But if you really see the remaining part, warming is very, very low. And second important um, information from this uh, figure is that warming is not very uniform. Uh, there are some places warming is very high, some places warming is low. Especially if you see the northern plains, northern close to Arctic, the warming is very high. And we call it is Arctic amplification, and mainly because of the feedback process which is occurring over that region. And Arctic amplification is very, very important for our climate system. And if you take the whole average of the earth temperature and plot in terms of anomalies from 1850, so we have temperature measurements using thermometers from 1850s. And even now, temperature measurements are being done using thermometers as well as from the space, you can calculate surface temperature, uh, especially sea surface temperature. And uh, so to all these measurements, if you put it together, uh, we have different data sets coming out from different research groups. We really plot the uh, anomaly curve, it shows something like this. You can see from 90 mid 70s, the temperature is shot up like anything. And uh, the anomalies for last 100 years are about 0.7 degree, 0.7 or 0.8 degree change from the mean climate. So there is a drastic change in the global temperature. <laughs> and, and global temperature, this is an average temperature. And as I told that uh, global temperature is, uh, the temperatures are 
the warming of temperature is not very uniform. In some places, it warms very large. Some places, it warms very less. And uh, this is the one uh, figure which very clearly shows that uh, it's basically a, it's, it's a model study. It's a, it's a done by a climate model uh, study, which very clearly demonstrate that and uh, anthropogenic effect, the nature of the human activity has really caused the changes in the uh, changes in the atmosphere and also the temperature. And what we have seen last uh, 30, 40 years or 50 years of temperature change is mainly caused by anthropogenic effect. So the so-called the global warming, there's a clear signal that it is caused by human activities so beyond doubt. Uh, the, the UN body IPCC in the governmental panel of climate change has clearly told there's a clear evidence of human activities in the global warming, what we are seeing now. It is beyond doubt. And uh, so we cannot explain what all we have seen last 50, 60 years cannot be explained by natural forcings. It should be explained only if we can account the, the human activities and changes in carbon dioxide concentration and methane concentration, etc. And also the changes in the sea level, and you can see the sea level changes also. The sea level, why sea level can occur? It can, it, sea level can change because of many factors. One is just a thermal expansion. It's a fluid, so temperature increases, it can expand. And the thermal expansion can change the sea level. And sea level, if you really plot, this is can be measured using satellites. And this satellite measurement, if you really plot and changes, and it can be very clearly seen that uh, sea level trends are not very uniform again, like temperature. Some places the sea level rise is very high, some places the sea level rise is very low. And if you really plot the whole global sea level rise, and if you plot from 93, 93 onwards satellite data are available, and you, you can see that it's almost about 80, uh, 80, 75, 80 uh, millimeter for the whole last uh, 25 years. It's almost three millimeter per year change is happening. The sea level is rising about three millimeter per year. It's a big number. And um, and if you, if you assume that this, this trend will go up and then uh, that will be really uh, alarming signal. And uh, so, so temperature uh, over land also is increasing, over, seas, over the oceans also, so-called sea surface temperature also is increasing. The warming is taking place everywhere, as I said. And, uh, and but not see the skin of the uh, ocean, not only the sea surface, but the whole uh, first, high, high, first 100 to 200 meter of the sea over the ocean also is increasing. This is, we call it ocean heat content, if we can uh, calculate temperature at about 100, 150 meter and average and take an uh, integral part and uh, calculate how much heat content is available for first 100, 100 meter. And that, that number also is increasing. That means not only the surface of the ocean is increasing, the whole first 500, uh, first 100 to 150 meter also is. So the, the warming is really going down in the ocean. So that also is very alarm. And the pH is because carbon dioxide is absorbed by for 25 percent of carbon dioxide, which we emit in the by activities, natural as well as human activities, absorbed by ocean. So ocean is a big absorber. So oceans is a very important in regulating our climate. And uh, so about 25 percent of anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions are absorbed by oceans. And when carbon dioxide is uh, absorbed by oceans, pH value changes. And we have very clearly shown so that there's a lot of changes in the uh, pH value. Another is a very important aspect is the Arctic sea ice content. And as we know, the Arctic is completely covered by sea ice. And as I also told that Arctic uh, bombing is much more than any other place. And mainly because it is called Arctic amplification of the feedback process which is occurring over that region. And mainly because of this bombing over the Arctic region, Arctic sea ice is, Arctic sea ice is melting very fast. And um, the when the sun comes in the north, the sea is melting is uh, it will start, and the melting will go on till September. So the the lowest sea ice can be expected sometime in September. Then again, see, uh, because of winter will come, sea ice will be again accumulated. So if you really calculate the September sea ice with respect to time, so 1980s onwards, this also is can be measured using sunlight. It's all microwave satellites. And if you really calculate this sea ice extent in terms of square kilometer or million square kilometer, you can plot this kind of graph and it very clearly shows that after 1990s, mid 1990s, 
is a drastic change in the sea ice content over Arctic sea ice extent in the Arctic, which is very, very alarming. So now because of this sea ice melting, people are talking about new politics in Arctic and new economics of Arctic and because people can, uh, can expect a Arctic sea without much ice. So ship routes will be more and you can have more uh, ships can fly and also oil can be taken out. So, so now people are talking about Arctic economics, economics of Arctic. So Arctic is becoming now strategically very, very important. At the same time, we are not, we should not forget that Arctic sea ice melting is not good for us. People are talking about the economics of sea ice melting and how, how money we can get. But at the same time, we should also remember that sea ice melting is not a good sign. And there are a lot of replications can be expected. Already people have seen that the extreme weather events happening in Europe, even to some extent, even in India, for example, month of March, what we are getting, uh, hail storms, etc., can be linked to Arctic sea ice melting. So it has both the side. It has a positive side, but it has a negative side. We should see both. And uh, these are the climate change projections of how the sea, sea ice will change. And if, uh, these are climate model projections. And uh, the, if you really, if you really believe these climate change projections, and it very clearly shows that by 2050 we will have an uh, uh, Arctic uh, uh, sea without uh, sea ice, especially in summer, in uh, September for summer. And uh, so if uh, climate change, so we have, I have very clearly showed that this uh, uh, greenhouse gases are changing, increasing, and because of that uh, climate is changing and many aspects of climate change, I told temperature, sea level rise, ocean heat content, etc., pH values, etc., and Arctic sea ice melting. And uh, also it can change uh, the extreme weather events. If I assume that um, temperature is, for example, mean climate is a normal distribution, any change in the mean um, to a slight, for example, can change the extreme weather event. Uh, and also the increased variability also can change the extreme weather events. And uh, both the change in mean as well as variability also can change the extreme weather events. So with this climate change, we should, we should expect not only changes in the mean pattern of the climate, but also the extreme other events, like for some heat waves, heavy precipitation events, floods, etc., also can increase. And we have seen in from observation, this extreme other events also is increasing. So climate change and extreme other events are linked because the mean climate is changing, so extreme other events also will increase. So this is about the global pattern and uh, I will give another uh, five minutes. I will stop here. And uh, what, is, what is happening with the temperature over, uh, what is happening over Indian region? The same same kind of trend temperature is increasing, uh, but rainfall, monsoon rainfall, monsoon rainfall is our bread and butter. It is uh, important for all of us. But monsoon rainfall, fortunately, if you take all India average, monsoon rainfall is not changing. But there are changes in regional uh, changes are occurring. For example, Kerala rain is decreasing. Rain in over Chhattisgarh, um, uh, eastern parts of MB, Bihar, rainfall is decreasing. But some area like uh, Maharashtra, Karnataka rainfall is uh, increasing and northeast uh, rainfall is decreasing. There are regional changes, but if you take all India average, there's some change. This is very important. This is the frequency of heavy rainfall. Left hand side is uh, heavy rainfall more than 10 centimeter, right hand side is heavy rainfall more than 15 centimeter. And if you really plot the graph of the last 100 years or so, it's substantial change is happening, especially last 30, 40 years. There's uh, ev clear evidence that the extreme weather events, extreme rainfall events, heavy precipitation, frequency of heavy precipitation is increasing with the time. And rain storms are the top one is the Jammu Kashmir Srinagar flood, top bottom one is the, the famous Uttarakhand flood. If you really, it's all contributed by just, not by just one or two hours of cloud burst, it's all caused by persistent heavy rains by because of some weather systems and we call it a rainstorm such weather systems we call rainstorms and if you really calculate the frequency of rainstorms or the duration of rainstorms that also is increasing so the the, the weather systems which can really cause a large scale floods also is increasing over the indian region the other is the heat wave this is a 2003 european heat wave in which about 40000 people died in few days and uh, now COVID, uh, people are talking about deaths. In a few days, in less than three or four days, 
uh, 40,000, oh, sorry, less than one week or so, uh, 40,000 people died in uh, Europe, especially in France and uh, uh, Germany and Italy. Many people died of, uh, due to heat wave. It's a very famous heat wave in 2003. And next heat wave occurred in 2010 in Russian heat wave. And uh, India also heat waves happening. And especially there are two areas where heat wave normally occur. The India, one is over Northwest India, and another is the coastal eastern, east, east, eastern coast of India, like uh, for example, the northern parts of Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, and Orissa. And if you really calculate the heat wave frequency, also it's increasing everywhere, especially northern, northern, northwest, central and northwestern parts, heat wave frequency is also increasing. So now, now question is how we will predict the future of the climate change. Uh, we know with observation, we know what we have changed over uh, the last few years, how much we have changed, uh, how much changes we have seen that we, I, I really um, uh, demonstrated. And But now question is what will happen in future? And that can be done only using climate models. So we need to develop the climate change models and uh, we call a system model. And um, the beginning I told, what do you mean by a system? It comprises of all five spheres and interaction, etc. everything. And so we should have a climate model, mathematical model, which have describes all these interactions, physical interactions, and also the equations solving the movement of air and the exchange of air, etc. So such kind of uh, air system modeling is very important. And our institute in Pune, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, has developed the first India's India's first, first earth system model. It's a very, very, very important contribution which the Ministry of Earth Science has done is the development of earth system model. And I will briefly mention how the earth system model happens. Basically, um, it's, 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 it's a, the equations which you use for earth system model is the same as the equation we use for numerical weather prediction. For example, what will happen weather for tomorrow? It's called uh, numerical weather prediction, short range forecast for some. The equations are same. There are six, six, six equations. And uh, the first horizontal moment equation, there are two um, uh, uh, X and Y. And the thermodynamic energy equation, mass, mass continuity equation, hydrostatic equilibrium, and water, main, water, water vapor mass uh, continuity equation. So these are the basic equations. We solve this equation. It's a non-linear partial differential equations. We have to solve using some different method because there are no analytical solution. We use different methods, for example, uh, finite difference, finite element, or spectral methods we follow. And we solve this equation. There are uh, terms called Q and all, F, Q, and S, P, and all. That is basically physical forces. And Q is nothing but diabetic uh, heating terms and that can be calculated using different physics uh, equations. And uh, so these are all the basic uh, how a weather and climate model looks. We, the whole globe we divide into different uh, uh, latitude, longitude uh, bands. And uh, then we solve this uh, above the earlier equations on at, at all these grid points. And uh, in a typical weather prediction and climate model, there were 10 million equations. Uh, about uh, 1 lakh uh, points and 100 levels and 10 variables and we solve it every 10 minutes. So we need huge computing power. And out of that um, mathematical equation I showed, the Q term is a physics physics term. It takes a lot of computation time. Uh, we need to really calculate how the radiation is coming from the top of the atmosphere, how it is interacting with the aerosol cloud, how the long wave radiation is going up, then how the cloud process is happening, how the uh, surface exchanges, uh, surface fluxes are exchanged. So many physical processes which I will show in the next slide. These are the physical process which we need to really calculate in the model. And for example, deep convection, shallow convection, how a cloud is forming. Uh, the physics behind shallow convection is different from the physics from uh, physics of deep convection and uh, interaction between radiation and convection clouds and the surface uh, ocean main with wind waves. The surface uh, surface fluxes, latent heat flux as well as uh, sensible heat flux. There's a lot of turbulent diffusion ha happening, orographic drag. These are all many physical processes which we need to really calculate and put it in that equation to solve those equations. So I said too that it's a huge a huge computing uh, resources are required. So we have a beautiful computer, the uh, computing facility. We have a um, MOS has the best and fastest computer in the country. We have uh, put, uh, we have two systems, one at uh, NOIDA, National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, one at uh, ATM Pune. Put together, we have put together about, we have 10 petop of machine, uh, which is one of the best, uh, which is one of the best in the world, as also the best in the uh, country. 
and we will be soon upgrading this 10 petaflop into 30 to 40 petaflop by next year. This is what our uh, our plan. So we need huge computing power to calculate these equations and uh, calculate what will be the climate in the future. Like the like typical weather forecast, weather prediction, we make it for next five days or 10 days. Uh, climate change prediction, we do it. We go on integrating these equations up to next 100 years or so and calculate how changes are happening. And uh, the, uh, our center in Pune uh, has brought out the first uh, national climate change assessment report. This is a pure scientific pursuit and uh, we wanted to know what has really happened in the climate and what will happen in the future climate. And I will uh, give you one or two, few, uh, two, three slides about the results, very salient results. And when you make the future climate change projections, we have to assume how these greenhouse gas, uh, sorry, the fossil fuel uh, uh, consumption and greenhouse gas will change. So we, we assume that there are different scenarios. One is assume that it's a business as usual. They assume that whatever we are burning, we will burn, we'll continue to burn all the countries. And uh, then uh, we can have put restrictions as the government is now, all government is coming up and government is getting together and they're putting a lot of, uh, a lot of restrictions in fossil fuel burning now. India has taken up a large initiative of going for non-conventional energy, especially for solar and wind energy, which is a very huge commitment. And both solar as well as wind, we are one of the best five in the country in making the quantum of energy, which we are producing the best five. And we have made a lot of commitments for um, non-fossil fuel energy. And uh, so we can have different scenarios. So the scenario is called 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. So different scenario, we can expect, expect uh, we can estimate how the temperature will change, how the precipitation will change, etc. I will tell you, RCP 8.5 is uh, even though we call it a RCP uh, business as usual, but it's a little far unrealistic scenario which we, we should not expect. We should, for real, uh, realistic estimate, we should concentrate more on RCP 4.5 or RCP 2.6. 4.5 will be ideal. And um, so 8.5 is a little scary, um, but uh, it's a really uh, kind of an outlier uh, of the climate change projections. And if you really calculate RCP 4.5 by 2100, uh, we can expect a further change by two degree of temperature over uh, India. And precipitation not but change. So we have a good news. The monsoon is not going to change even if warming is uh, likely to continue. And uh, this is a very important thing. Let, let, uh, top two figures shows cold nights as well as cold days are going to decrease. Whereas the warm nights as well as warm days are going to increase. So that means uh, we will have less and less cold waves, but more and more of uh, heat waves. And this is also, the, as I told that heavy precipitation. The, the frequency of heavy precipitation also is going to increase. If you really calculate uh, maximum five day precipitation or the daily intensity index, all are showing an increase. So what we have seen in the summary is increase in surface air temperature and humidity levels, which is sure, on the next 30, 40 years. Increase in heat waves, we are sure. Increase in uh, extreme weather like heavy rains or strong winds, intense tropical cyclone, convective storms, and no change in mean monsoon rainfall is a good sign. An increase in variability of monsoon, more floods and droughts, increase in sea level and also coastal erosion can be expected. Uh, now scientists have identified uh, climate tipping points. Tipping points find no return, the point of no returns. We have, uh, they have identified for some Arctic sea ice, Atlantic circulation, Amazon rainforest, boreal forest, Greenland ice sheet, West Antarctic ice sheet, Ice, ice loss oscillating in the uh, eastern uh, uh, Antarctica, coral reefs of uh, coast of uh, Australia, permafrost thawing in uh, eastern parts of Asia. So these are all some tipping points we've identified that these are all very critical elements of climate change. And this is going to, uh, alarm, going to be very alarming and is going to really take place. And uh, this is the, uh, probably the last slide, the World Economic Forum. They discussed about money and economy, and they identified 10 top 10 risks over the next 10 years for the human beings. And you will not believe, they, they're not talking about any economic crisis. They're talking about the first one is extreme weather is going to be a long term risk for likelihood of climate action failure. That means government is not taking any action. Uh, natural disasters, 
biodiversity loss and human made environment disorders this is the first five all related to environment and climate and it is not by uh, it's not produced by climate scientists it's produced by world economic forum and uh, of course later they talk about asset bubble and global governance failure and all which i am not able to understand what you mean and uh, so the first five uh, risks are related to climate as well as in the i think so I, this is the last slide so let us save our beautiful blue planet uh, may not be for ourselves but at least for our children and grandchildren with this uh, i will stop here once again thank you csar for giving me this opportunity to talk to people on science of climate change thank you thank you very much thank you very much sir this is a an extremely delightful voyage to the science of climate change and we are delighted to have and there are a large number of uh, questions and <laughs> i request my colleagues to uh, conduct the question answer session right <laughs> thank you so much sir thank you so much sir and uh, i thank our speaker also for such an informative lecture sir i think it was very interesting and especially uh, when you talked about the paleo climate and the arctic uh, economies i think these uh, insights were very important and also at this time um, the topic and the lecture was re really very relevant as we all know that our country is facing uh, this huge challenge of heavy rains in various parts of the country and I think there was no time uh, more relevant than this to talk about climate change. Thank you so much once again, sir. And we have a separate team who were uh, collecting uh, all the questions that we got from YouTube, Facebook and MS Teams. So, uh, and also so many comments sir, uh, complimenting your lecture, uh, saying that it was such an informative uh, lecture and they're so happy to be a part of today's session. So thank you once again, sir. And I would like to now uh, request uh, my uh, young friend, uh, Ms. Lisa Moni, to please take uh, five or six uh, selective questions. Uh, sir, uh, Vilika, if the sir has time, there were so many questions and uh, uh, Lisa and Monty, Please ask, sir, uh, before uh, because there are a large number of questions, and I hope that yes. if sir has time, we will be able to put more questions to him. Okay, Lisa. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and thank you, sir, uh, for your very interesting and enlightening lecture. Uh, it was a great pleasure for all of us to listen to you. And there are lots of questions. Uh, we have selected a few of them. And if you permit, we can go ahead. Yes, 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 yes. Sir, so the first question is from Bhuvan Bhaskar Tripathi. He's asking if metrogenic bacteria produces methane gas, which is a part of greenhouse gas, then how is biogas plant helpful for us? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I will not able to, probably I may not be able to answer that question. I don't know how we have biofuel, how much it contributes to methane. And uh, so the, probably the quantity may be much small. That's what. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is from Anjali JB. Uh, she is asking, uh, do climate change have some positive impact in any field? Pardon? Uh, sir, do climate change have uh, some positive impact in any field? Animals. No, no, sir. In any other field? Uh, any other field? Huh? Yes. Any other field? Yeah, some people say that because I say too that the impact of climate change is not uniform. Some countries gain to, uh, uh, going to gain, for example, agriculture. And especially in the northern countries like the northern parts of America, Canada, Russia, they are going to gain of a global warming of for agriculture in their country. Uh, some, some positive things, but uh, mostly of all negative. The adverse impacts are more much more than the benefits out of global warming. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Bablin Kaur. She is asking, does extensive use of solar panels can disturb the balance between solar energy and Earth's energy ratio? Uh, solar panels be used uh, for uh, generating electricity will not really affect uh, because that is kept at the surface of the air. 
if you really put a solar panel on the top of the atmosphere, probably it will affect. But uh, this this kind of uh, solar panels in a small area at the surface of the earth will not affect the energy balance. We, we should not worry. Solar panels are good, so we should have more solar energy. We are basically tapping what is coming at the surface of the earth. Solar energy coming at the surface of the earth. That's all we are doing. We are not going. We are not changing the energy balance. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Sneha Jadeza. She is asking, in order to rebuild the ozone layer, what remedies can be opted other than afforestation? See, ozone hole, uh, there is a Montreal protocol in 1970s or so. So what they have um, um, told the CFC gases uh, should be banned. And uh, there's a lot of restriction now of using CFC gases. And I'll tell you there's a lot of um, uh, benefit out of that um, Montreal Protocol. Uh, even though the uh, ozone hole is not completely um, uh, came back to the original levels, and ozone hole is nothing but uh, the concentration of anything below 220 uh, parts per million, uh, sorry, 220 units, uh, Dobson units. And uh, if it is less than that, then it is called uh, ozone hole. And, uh, uh, and so, the ozone hole is not really increased. There are year-to-year -year variations. But this Montreal Protocol, which has a given restriction on using CFC gases, high near gases, greenhouse gases, which can trouble uh, the ozone hole, uh, is really uh, giving benefits out of it. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Akanksha Pandey. Uh, sir, is there any relation between the sea level rise and the temperature rise in nearby areas? Yeah, see, uh, temperature, most of the sea level rise is caused by temperature rise. As I told that uh, the ocean is uh, nothing but a liquid, so it can have a thermal expansion because temperature is rising. So they have a lot of uh, relationship, but of course sea level rise can be also can occur because of some other reasons also. Ocean, personal oceanic phenomena also can cause sea level rise. Uh, sir, the next question is from Madhushmita Das. She is asking, as the SST is increasing day by day, what can we expect uh, with respect to the SST variations in Indian monsoon? Well, uh, that's why so Indian Ocean is, for example, warming up. There are such studies. Indian, for example, if, uh, if you take all the ocean, Indian Ocean is uh, warming much faster than any other oceans. And uh, so many uh, the studies are suggesting that that can really cause induction in monsoon rainfall. And also it can cause more uh, intense rainfall precipitation events over Indian monsoon region. So uh, SST changes uh, occurring over Indian Ocean has some definitely some impact on Indian monsoon. Yeah, but we need to really study more. So, sir, the next question is from Muhammad Azam Khan. He is asking, what is the advantage of ocean heat content? Ocean heat can advantage means it's a basically a physical parameter called uh, measuring how much ocean heat content is there in the first 500 or 150 meter of the ocean. It's a physical parameter. You can calculate if you know the temperature profile uh, from surface to 100 or 150 meter. And um, so that is ma mainly used to calculate, estimate how much ocean heat content is there in the ocean. And if you know, if you really see the tropical cyclone is increasing in the intensity is mainly related to the ocean heat content. And if ocean heat content is increasing, we can expect that when tropical cyclones form, its intensity can increase much faster. Okay, sir. The next question is, with the help of coding, can we know the future of climate change? Yeah, that's what uh, that uh, system model is nothing but um, mathematical equation and physics, uh, equations of physics, and we solved using some computer methods and using high, high performance computer. We uh, predict what will happen in the future. It's not a prediction; we call projections. Uh, projections of climate change in the in the in the future. We do it up to 2050, 70, 80, 90, etc. Uh, uh, so the next question is uh, again from Sneha Jadeza. She is asking uh, if you think introduction of 5G technology will be harmful for the environment. Pardon? Can you repeat that question? Yes, sir. Sure, sir. So she is asking uh, if you think the introduction of 5G technology 
will be harmful for the environment. High C technology. Which thing 5G, sir. 5G. 5G, 5G technology. Yeah, yes. Uh, 5G yes. technology. I'm not uh, sure about 5G technology, about uh, uh, climate change. I'm not sure whether really 5G technology will impact climate change. But there is a there is a side effect of 5G technology which we are or we meteorologists are talking. I will just brief you. Uh, probably probably some people may be interested. The the way the 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 way the spectrum of radiation, um, uh, the so-called uh, the microwave band which they are using for 5G is going to be very similar of wave the microwave energy being used by satellites for measuring many important parameters by satellites, by sea surface temperature, cloud properties, etc. We have, we told, I told you that there are satellites, we use a lot of satellites for measuring atmospheric parameters and also the, the uh, parameters related to the cloud, sea ice, etc. So we call some, some satellites are based on um, uh, near infrared as well as uh, visible band, some uh, satellites are based on microwave energy. And so these microwave energy satellites are going to be hampered, are going to be affected because of this 5G technology. So we meteorologists, not only in India, all over the world, is little concerned about the introduction of 5G technology, whether that is going to affect the, the, the microwave satellites being used for measuring, for example, sea surface temperature or cloud properties. So it has a side effect. And so probably we are discussing very seriously. I, I am not sure what is the latest uh, status of that. But it may not have an impact on, I am not sure about the impact on climate change. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is from Komal Bhati. Uh, can you please share something regarding how can data science and bioinformatics play a role in climate resilience agriculture? Oh, well, that's a good question, but I am not a good expert in uh, bioscience. So, uh, but I am very sure that as uh, when climate change changing, we should have a uh, mitigation methods, you know, to how, how we will cope up with the, for example, agriculture. So we should have uh, crops uh, which are climate resilient crops. So their biotechnology will play, bioscience will play an important role. And uh, I'm very sure that in, uh, ministry like the, uh, the, uh, DBT, CSAR uh, institutions are working on that. Uh, even also ICAR institutions are working on to develop uh, climate resilient agriculture crops. So bioscience will play an important role, uh, especially on mitigating the, the adverse effect of climate change on agriculture. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Shubha Kangshi Priyadarsini. She is asking, does the hydrothermic vent has any role in temperature rise in sea level? Uh, not so, not so, not so. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is from uh, Sudhir. He is asking, what is the role of an individual towards the climate change in your view? Uh -huh. yeah, each individual is responsible for climate change and how you, how you um, live, uh, for example, a way of living. And uh, probably we should have more of uh, green technology we should use. We should have more environment friendly acts we should do it. We should plant trees, etc. So each individual can contribute, especially in minimizing the adverse effect of climate change. But um, just planting a tree behind your house is not sufficient, but it is good. We should do that, but that may not be sufficient. We need uh, large scale policy decisions by government, all the government, not only by Indian government, because as I told the climate, the carbon dioxide is not the gas which is produced by only India. It is produced by many, all the countries. And any action by only by India will not really help to uh, um, to reduce the global warming. All countries should uh, really contribute. Then only the global warming because it's a, a carbon dioxide is a uniformly mixed gas. And what we are seeing here is not only really because of our emission, but the emission by, by other countries also. So we need a collective global uh, kind of a decision process we should have to control the fossil fuel emission. Uh, sir, if you have uh, time, can we ask uh, three or four more questions? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay, sure, sure. Okay. So the next question uh, 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 is asking, uh, what are the factors responsible for Arctic amplification? Yeah, basically it's a feedback process for some albedo effect uh, because sea ice is there, albedo effect or uh, ocean processes. These are all some of the 
factors which are uh, causing uh, arctic amplification. It's not physical uh, feedback processes. Mm -hmm. You can ask the next question. Uh, thank you, sir. So the next question is, uh, when can we expect the sea level rise to pose a serious threat to live livelihood in our peninsular area in India? Well, the uh, climate change projections are um, uh, again, it's about three millimeter per year. And uh, at least uh, we should not worry about next, next 20, 30 years. And there are a lot of uncertainty in um, in climate change position that we should always remember, especially if you go for the global average, the projections are pretty good. And then also maybe next 30, 40 years, it could be pretty good. But regional changes, what we are projecting from the climate model, there could be a lot of uncertainties. That's why when if you really see our latest uh, climate change report, which is produced by IATM or IPCC report, they normally write likely, very likely, um, uh, kind, that kind of words using probabilities. So, uh, so over regional sea level rise, how much it will rise? And whether people are talking about electricity violence will go down underwater, Maldives will go underwater, Bangladesh will go underwater. It could be, but uh, there's a lot of uncertainty also. And uh, so, we need to really uh, estimate uncertainties related to these regional climate change projections. So, we need to really work more. Sir, so I'm, I will ask the last question, uh, yeah. which is from Anjali Agrawal. She is asking, how is the climate of India benefit in comparison to other countries and what challenges uh, to be focused to mitigate the population growth, which has adverse effects on environment? Can you, can you repeat that question? I could not yes, follow. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure, sir. Sir, how is the climate of India benefit in comparison to other countries and what challenges to be focused to mitigate the population growth which has adverse effects on environment yeah uh, see as i told that uh, our climate is uh, indian climate also is changing and there could be we can expect a lot of uh, changes in extreme weather events next uh, 20 30 years so our uh, our uh, we should have policies we should have uh, mitigation uh, new technology to combat this climate change effects and uh, population is uh, definitely is going to be a play an important role. More people, I can because the consumption will be more and uh, in the energy as well as water and food. And uh, so the impact of uh, climate change could be more if we have the country has more population. So that is going to be re really a problem. And uh, so I probably will have more difficulty in, in controlling the adverse effect of climate change because of more and more demand for water, for example, more demand for more food, demand for more energy. For example, if heat waves are going to come, there will be a lot of consumption in using um, air conditioners, etc., in, especially in urban cities. So, uh, if more people use electricity, um, uh, ACs, then we need more energy. So, the demand will be more. So, it will have a uh, kind of a feedback process in the climate change system. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Thank you. for answering all the questions. I am now handing over the session to Ilka, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for so patiently answering all the questions. So on behalf of my director, Dr. Sastri, SRTP team and all the participants today, I thank you once again, sir, for spending your valuable time this morning to deliver today's lecture. Uh, despite your uh, very busy schedule. Thank you so much. So with your permission, we would like to close the session. So to do this, I would like yes, to now request Dr. Anjana yes. Agarwal, uh, Director CSIR NISTETS, New Delhi, to propose the word of thanks. And as mentioned by our director, both uh, ma'am and Professor uh, Alok Dhawan from IITR has been, uh, have been very instrumental in the formation and implementation of uh, the SRTP program. So I would like to now request ma'am to please uh, propose the word of thanks. Over to you ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Anjana says I just wanted to say one thing, that uh, there were a large number of questions and I was very much impressed by them and we will be answering these questions to the participants and, and then probably we will uh, collect the answers from uh, sir in the due course. So I, on the behalf of all the participants, I again thank 
Professor Rajivan for giving this wonderful talk. And Dr. Anjana, please go. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sasi. Uh, respected Dr. Madhavan Rajivan, Secretary, Ministry of Arts Science, Chairman, Art Commission. Uh, it's a matter of great pleasure for me to propose a vote of, of thanks. Uh, after such an inspirational lecture, uh, uh, I will. Uh, I, I was going through the whole uh, PowerPoint presentation, and you know, you have woven the story so beautifully for the students, starting from the uh, earth system to climate change, their reasons, factors. And you know the evidence-based data, which is very very important because you know uh, at the present time everybody is talking of climate change, and sometimes when there is so much buzz, we start taking it you know a common thing. Okay, everybody is talking about it, so we don't we take it seriously, but don't give it much attention because everybody is talking about it. But the way you express it and the evidence-based data you provide it. Like uh, the climate change is, uh, uh, is being affected by external factors as well as by internal factors and in internal causes also you talked about the natural variability or, and also the anthropogenic activities. And by the end of the slide you could you know uh, clearly uh, uh, present that point that human uh, related activities are really responsible for the climate change. And we should become more sensitive towards environment. Uh, and one thing more, I would like to say uh, after listening to your lecture, our students must have got uh, motivated because most of the students who are participating in this program, they are from the uh, basic science. And uh, or the engineer, uh, engineering scientists. So they are not. Uh, many of them are not yet exposed to uh, different branches of science, which are uh, in the niche areas like uh, paleoclimatology or meteorology, uh, weather modeling, oceanography, polar studies, etc. So I think after listening your talk, they will also get motivated to start making their career options in these fields. And all of us who have attended this lecture, uh, I think they will be sort of brand ambassadors now uh, to uh, mitigate uh, the uh, problems uh, causing the climate change. And uh, hopefully, as you said in the in your slide, that we will be able to protect our blue planet for the next generation. We will be handing over to you. So once again, I would like to thank you very much for the brilliant lecture which you have presented. I would also like to thank Dr. Shastri for giving me this opportunity to propose vote of thanks and Dr. Alok Dhawan. Um, so a very big thanks to the participants who patiently listened and then asked the questions. And I think from the variety of questions and the number of questions, it is well evident like how interested the lecture was. Once again, Dr. Rajivan, I would thank like you. to thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.